We have four invited speakers, and I'm so honored to present and introduce the first speaker, Hank Osinka. Hank Osinka is a professor of applied mathematics at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, she got her PhD at the University of Groningen, Netherlands. And she had position at the Geometry Center in Minneapolis, Caltech, and the University of Exeter. Exeter. She then had a tenure, uh, tenured position at the University of Bristol for more than 10 years before taking up uh, her professionalship in Auckland in 2011. And her research interests are in applied dynamic systems and center around the development of numerical methods for computing invariant manifolds and their interactions in parameter dependent settings with uh, many applications to physic physics and engineering area. Yeah, many different <laughs> research areas. So I'm uh, uh, let's share big hands for first uh, talk. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really delighted to be here and have been invited to speak at ICN. And uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about computing global and very manifolds, techniques and application. And uh, as you said, the um, the area of my interest is applied dynamical systems, but let me first give you a really uh, restricted setting that I really focus on, and uh, that is a, a system of ordinary differential equations. So I am interested in vector field flows, where I can write the system as a, a, a velocity uh, flow. My phase space is uh, Euclidean space, Rn, and this example here uh, takes place in R3. And so just to make sure that we all know what I'm talking about, um, I have the flow that's generated by this ordinary differential equation system is uh, the, the defined by some phi, and so I can follow an initial condition in time. Uh, there are special points in my phase space called equilibria, in which case my right hand side is equal to zero, so there's no velocity, that's a steady state, I will stay there. And um, this equilibrium is, um, well, we, we like to analyze that in a very special way. We look at the linearization, calculating eigenvalues, and if you were at this morning's talk of Michal uh, or Misha uh, Lubitz, then uh, he was talking about fixed points of maps, it was discrete time. So I'm in talking about vector fields. My eigenvalues have to be to the left of the imaginary axis if they are stable, and to the right of the imaginary axis if they're unstable. And I don't want any eigenvalues on the imaginary axis because then I would not have a hyperbolic equilibrium. So as soon as my equilibrium is hyperbolic, there is a whole manifold theory that tells me that these stable and unstable manifolds exist. So these are manifolds associated with these eigenvalues. I count the number of stable eigenvalues and it gives me the dimension of the stable manifold, which is a, um, a surface or hypersurface in Rn, where uh, I consider only those initial conditions that under the flow in forward time are being taken to my equilibrium P. The unstable manifold similarly consists of all the points that if you go backward in time, you go to the equilibrium P. So if P is an attractor, then the stable manifold is just well, locally the whole space, and the unstable manifold will then be empty. But if P is a saddle point, and you have both stable and unstable eigenvalues, then you have sub-manifolds in phase space. And so the example that you see running here is in, as I said, in R3, this is actually the system of uh, Edward Lorenz, so his Lorenz equations, where you have the butterfly attractor that uh, predicts this chaotic dynamics, or that, that 
exhibits chaotic dynamics. And so what we see here is a, the equilibrium zero, that's the point there. Zero is an equilibrium for the Lorentz equations. It has one unstable eigenvalue and two stable eigenvalues. And that means there's a one-dimensional unstable manifold, that's this red curve. There are two sides, one side here and the other side that you cannot see, but now you can see it on the other side. Then the stable manifold, because there are two stable eigenvalues, that is a surface in R3. And so the surface is really the challenging bit. If you want to calculate a one-dimensional manifold, that's effectively calculating trajectories in the vector field. Now, you can argue whether if you do that on the computer, whether that's uh, accurate enough and things, but how to do that is completely clear. But the moment we go to two-dimensional manifolds or higher-dimensional manifolds, things get very complicated. And so this is a very active area of research where you try to find out how to get a, an appropriate mesh, really, on this surface so that you can calculate such manifolds. And note that the way the definition of these manifolds works is not an explicit or even an implicit equation to get the <coughs> object. You really need to generate it from this definition that the flow goes somewhere. So that's very difficult. Now, there are many people who have worked on trying to compute in very manifolds, and in particular uh, on two-dimensional manifolds, there is a very nice uh, survey article that uh, uses the Lorentz equations as the test example. And so these methods tend to be generalizable to higher dimensions, but here the focus is really on this R3 setting. Uh, there are several groups, so the one that has my name associated with it is uh, uh, with my uh, long-term collaborator, Bert Kraushoff, and uh, we use geodesic level sets. And that's the example that you saw on the previous slide where the manifold is grown nicely in circular concentric rings. Uh, then uh, the second one by Xavier's Doodle is really a more general setup of uh, boundary value problem continuation and I'm going to talk more about that because our setup also uses continuation of a two-point boundary value problem but in a slightly different context. Now uh, Mike Henderson has um, taken this idea to compute fat trajectories. So the way to think about this is that you follow the flow not just for the initial condition, but you also take additional derivatives. And so it's like you're taking a whole jet that you take into time and generate the manifold that way. So he calls them fat trajectories. Now, there's also a method for doing this in a PDE context. And so you can formulate your, the invariance of the manifold as a PDE problem and solve that. And so that's by Guggenheimer and uh, Alex Vladimirsky. Um, then the final one is a bit different approach. It's finding an outer covering. So the box is, has the dimension of the phase space and you try to find boxes that have a particular diameter and you find the whole family of boxes that you know the manifold lies inside of those. And the fewer boxes you have, the better of course it approximates you. Now I guess I'm going to focus on these top two methods in this talk. That's mostly because that's what I know most about. Also, this, um, this case of calculating the manifold growing it by geodesic level sets is the one where uh, Bert Krauskopf and I have found really uh, 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 proof that we have error estimates that you unfortunately can't do before you start the computation, but after the computation you can find out the actual numerical error that you make using this approximation. And so that's uh, proof is, um, is actually available and uh, we rely on that a lot. And similarly with the boundary value problem continuation, there are very strong uh, numerical analysis results that give you the accuracy of what's going on here. So how does that work with two-point boundary value problems? So um, the idea is that you look at orbit segments. So you're not thinking of this manifold as just being unbounded, which it often is. You select a region of interest and you're looking at just those orbit segments that lie on the manifold in that region of interest. Um, and so you can formally define that. Uh, the way we do this is by rescaling time. So our orbit segments always start with time equal zero and they end at time equal one. And the way to do that is just to put the total integration time on the right hand side. And so now you just look at the rescaled system. 
but you haven't actually changed anything really. So in this example, you could imagine that we're calculating the stable manifold of the Lorentz equation, so P here would be the origin. I have two stable eigenvalues, and so there are two eigenvectors associated with that. And so those would be those two vectors here. And now I choose an ellipse around this uh, equilibrium, and that lies in the plane that is spanned by those two eigenvectors. And so that gives me a linear approximation of the stable manifold, because the theory tells me that the stable manifold is tangent to the eigenspace of the associated stable eigenvectors. And so I have an elliptic curve here, and I call that L theta, and I'm going to assume that my initial condition is on this curve. So that restricts the motion of the initial condition, but not completely. It depends on the parameter theta. And then I look at the orbit segment that ends in this particular example, say, in a plane. There are other options. You could say you take a fixed integration time, t. So you just find all the orbit segments that lie in this, on this, well, they start on this uh, ellipse, and then they have a total integration time. If you calculate stable manifolds, that integration time t then needs to be negative. Just so for the experts here, if you're thinking along. The fixed arc length is another one. You could just measure the arc length of your, uh, of your trajectories, and then you find a family with a particular arc length. Uh, there are other ways. You can take the product between integration time and arc length. It's a very nice approach that is very useful in particular contexts that we have applied for the Lorentz equations. Um, and this last one that looks very complicated, but that's this case. You have some implicitly defined surface, here a plane, and you just say that your endpoint needs to lie on that surface. So what is happening here? I have here one particular orbit segment, but if I vary theta, I get a whole family. So I have my one orbit segment, as the first one is always a bit difficult to find, and then I sweep my family in theta by solving the two-point boundary value problem using pseudo arc length continuation. So pseudo arc length continuation was started with Herb Keller, and Sapius Duhul has written very nice software that uh, can do that for you. So all you need to do is think about how to formulate your boundary value problem and how to get the boundary conditions in appropriately. That's a skill. So the actual software packages that can do that for you, I mentioned already the one by Sabius Doodle, that's Auto, that's one of the oldest. Um, there are two dates here, the first one is when it appeared, and the last one is when the last update was, that I know of. And so, um, and this is of course where you can get it. So um, this package is what we're using in, uh, in the research that, that I do. Um, here is XPP Out is a larger package that actually incorporates the 1997 version of Auto. So it's really Auto with more. But um, uh, that's by Bart Ermitraud. Uh, Frank Schilder and Harry Dankovic have a very recently developed package called Coco. And uh, Hofarts and Kuznetsov have MatCon, and Coco and MatCon are both MATLAB based packages. So you need to buy MATLAB and then you can use their software. So we have our idea of a boundary value problem formulation. We have a package that we can choose. And so I'm going to choose auto, just so you know. And now is the question, what can you now do with these things? So you can calculate these manifolds, but you know, why would you want to do that? And so the applications are really incredibly diverse. And um, the more I find out what's going on about just another application, and you go, oh, it would be very useful to calculate manifolds here. Uh, the one that I put here is, is a transition to chaos in the Lorentz system. Well, you could say the Lorentz equations, don't we know everything about it? No, we don't. This is a publication that actually appeared, but there is more to come. Um, and uh, it's a very exciting area, but here we're calculating stable manifold and other manifolds in the Lorentz equations. Um, but of course, this transition to chaos is, could be relevant in other contexts. Now, when you have systems just of ordinary differential equations, there is often extra structure that we get 
from the fact that some of the variables are fast and others are slow in how they evolve in time. And so these so-called slow, fast, or multiple time scale systems, this, they utilize instruction. You'll see an example of that later. And so there, there is this notion of a slow manifold that really organizes how the flow behaves in such a multiple time scale system. And uh, it turns out that using this boundary value problem setup, you can calculate such manifolds as well, even though they are, strictly speaking, not invariant manifolds. They only invariant for a finite amount of time. Um, so in this paper, that's a big review paper in Science Review, and uh, there is also a lot of uh, names involved here. So Mathieu de Roche was a PhD student at Bert Rastoff and myself, John Guggenheimer, a PhD student Christian Kuhn, and then Martin Wexelberger, who's really one of the experts in the so far time scale settings. We combine theory and, and uh, numerical com uh, computations in this review paper. Um, <coughs> here is an application of computing isochrons. Now, from a purely dynamic system point of view, isochrons are actually stable manifolds. But if you're working in, say, a biological context and you're looking at rhythms, uh, how to deal with jet lag when you fly to a different place like Korea from New Zealand. Um, these are to do with how you have a periodic rhythm of being in a 24 hour clock, say, and then you get this perturbation and you need to shift your, your rhythm to the new sort of setting. And uh, the way to, uh, to analyze that is using isochrons, which are the, um, well, the some, I don't know what the jet lag phase space is, that would be an interesting question. But then in that phase space, you would have to find all the points that are in phase with, say, being in cell gray. So that's uh, work with PC uh, student Peter Langfield. And um, we can calculate these isochrons and really understand how they foliate the basis of attraction of our periodic cycles. There's a lot more coming out of that than just calculating. Uh, here is an uh, example that is also very uh, recent work uh, with Krasi Uh We're looking at really working with experimentalists in a biological context, and they are very much interested in how do, uh, so these are neural cells in the brain, how do these neural cells actually are capable of things without really performing it per se. So it's called the intrinsic excitability. If you would influence yourself from an external stimulus, what would you be able to expect? And uh, the, again, there are no invariant manifolds here, but you can still use the whole setup for two-point value <laughs> on conservation. And so it's a very interesting area. Um, Phase resetting is somewhat related to this excitability and to isochrones is um, also where you try to understand how a cell is organized. How you, in some sense you could see it as a model validation. So you found a model, you have the experiment, you can do a phase resetting test to find out what's going on. And uh, in their manifolds are incredibly important here. Um, this is work with Julie Stern, Andrew Lebeau and Arthur Sherman. And I want to talk about this particular example next. So the last one that I put up here, which will be the second example that I discuss in this lecture, is about grazing in non-autonomous systems. So I told you the setting. I had a system of ordinary differential equations. I didn't actually tell you that they were autonomous, but until I started this work, they always were. But it doesn't matter. You can put a non-autonomous system in, and it works just the same. And so this is a very exciting example that I'd love to tell you about, but we have to... Uh, but, so I, I talked about these two examples here, and this particular paper, that's with civil engineers, uh, Nick Alexander, Olaf Orbjörnsson, Colin Taylor, and Dave Kelly, and that's uh, JSV, uh, in case you don't know, that's the Journal of Sound and Vibration, but it was too long to put on the slide. So let me go with the first case study, if you want. Why is it so interesting to be able to compute in very manifolds and what can you do with it? So here, um, this is a, really in the area of neuroscience, 
Um, we try to understand phase resetting behavior of so-called well, pseudo-quantal bursting, that's a difficult word, in pituitary neurons. Now, I frankly know very little about pituitary neurons, but they are, so pituitary region sits in the hypothalamus, which sits in the brain, and it's really deep in, in the back of your head. Uh, it's a very important area. So all the neural cells in there, they really organize almost everything. If anything goes wrong there, you're in big trouble. Um, so the particular cells that uh, I've been looking at uh, are called somatotroph cells, and here you see a picture of it. Uh, a somatotroph cell secretes growth hormone. So it better knows how much and when and all this kind of stuff. Um, so here you see the cell soma and these little granules, that's growth hormones. And so um, I got into this with, uh, via Arthur Sherman, who is the director of the Math Biology Institute at the National Institutes of Health. And uh, he essentially discovered this particular bursting pattern. And so it turns out that these somatotroph cells burst differently from other pituitary cells. And so he's really interested in how can you distinguish these types of cells from an experimental setting from the cells that you would pick in the brain otherwise? So you have a slice, and how do you know which kind of cell do you have? Um, this is a recording, it's an actual experimental data that I got kindly from Richard Bertram, and uh, he runs a lab together with Joel Tabak um, uh, at the Florida State University. And so they have here, uh, a recording of what such a cell actually does in terms of what the voltage potential across the cell membrane tells you. And so this voltage membrane starts, well, minus 50 in mathematical speed is of course not low, but biologists just look in the direction of pump. So, um, I mean, uh, the direction along the real axis, so minus 50 they find low and minus 10 they find high. Okay, um, so you go up and then at the high state, you have these bursting patterns, and this is the moment where the growth hormone gets released. And then you have a relaxation back to the sort of silent phase where nothing happens, the cell recovers, and then you get a burst again. Now what is interesting about these bursts is that there is a clear overshoot at the beginning, but there is also a very strange way of how the amplitude modulates. And so that's very hard to see in these recordings, and um, you really need to trust the experimentalists here that they say this is very important. The way this amplitude goes down and then sometimes at the end it goes back up. It doesn't just completely take off all the time. So what they want to do in this cell model, uh, in this experiment, is be able to predict, just using an experimental test, what type of cell you have. And so the way to go about this at least the way uh, we've gone about it, is that we've developed a model and tried to predict with the model how you can distinguish this particular cell type from another. And so we have to make a model. And so I put here still the recording slide from Richard Bertram and Joel Tabak's lab, and here is a time series of the model that was developed. Andrew Legault was the co-author on this paper actually developed this model. And so it is, I'm not going to give you the equations, I don't think it's very helpful, um, but if you really want to know about it, there are um, hodgkin huxley style equations, so this formalism is always very similar. You have ionic currents that generate your voltage potential, then you have a number of gating variables that decide when your uh, channels open and close, which means that ionic particles come in and out, and that's exactly what generates these currents. And there is a, in this particular situation of the somatotrope or any pituitary cell, there is a calcium parameter that keeps track of how much calcium is actually stored inside the cell. This is a very important variable because calcium is toxic. So if you have too much of it in the cell, the cell dies. And so the cell better release the calcium in a periodic fashion. And so we have this, what you could consider regular periodic motion, and so what the model does, it has a pure periodic motion that's being generated. 
Now, what is interesting about this equation, it has multiple time scales. The calcium, the amount of calcium in the cell modulates very slowly, and the gating variables, they're, well, you could call them fast relative to calcium, but they're not fast relative to voltage. Voltage is very fast. So, the way to look at how this bursting is actually generated is a technique that goes back to ICN 1986. So, John Rinzel there uh, presented this technique, saying that, well, if calcium is so slow, why don't we just pretend that it is just fixed, it doesn't change. And so now we're getting a curve, a family that depends on calcium of equilibria, and there is a curve here and a curve there, then the blue ones, these blue ones are attracting equilibria. And you can think of these lower ones as the one associated with the silent phase of the voltage potential, and then this top one would be the bursting phase, when the growth hormone is secreted. So, there is another curve of equilibria here. These are saddle equilibria, and the saddle and the silent state, stable equilibria, they disappear in a saddle node bifurcation for a relatively low value of calcium. So the bursting phase ends in a hop bifurcation, where you again get a branch of uh, unstable equilibrium. And the Hopf bifurcation gives subcritical, it gives rise to a family of periodic orbits, and I'm only showing the maximum and the minimum values of phi here. And so this family of periodic orbits, it grows in, in size until it undergoes a home clinic bifurcation where it, um, uh, it, well, the, the satellite equilibrium uh, meets the periodic orbit and then they disappear. Uh, the periodic orbit disappears. So, what did John Rinsell do with this information? He said, well, actually, calcium, of course, is not slow. It's slowly modulating. But if I change calcium a little bit, I will just follow these attractors in the system. And so if I overlay my time series, which is a periodic motion, I see here that in my time series, the voltage first goes up. I start to burst. This is because these equilibria are spiraling things. And, um, the, there's maybe good to mention, pseudoplateau bursting has this special property that this part is relatively fast, so I don't converge to these equilibria fast enough. I just try to converge to them, but then I start feeling this repelling periodic orbits, and I get repelled away again, and then at some point I drop down, and now calcium, for low voltage, will decrease. And so I start tracing my attracting rest here until I leave the cell, no bifurcation, and then I jump back up, and at high voltage calcium will increase. And so I have a nice modulation of both the voltage going from bursting phase to silent phase that is completely followed by the calcium being in, going into the cell and being pumped back out again. So, I was going to talk about phase resetting. I want an experimental trick here. So the way to think about this is to say, I'm going to give this cell an external stimulus. And this is done by having an electrode attached to the cell and you give an applied current. And so what I'm going to do is give that during the silent phase. And I've chosen here at the round calcium equal 1. And so in the singular limit, if calcium is 1, it won't change. And so if I'm in the silent phase, I will be roughly at the equilibrium for calcium equal 1. And so if I now give a stimulus, I'm going to, well, shoot up or maybe down, could go either way, but in this case I go up, and, um, and then I want to see whether I can generate a bursting phase. Now the reason that we do this is because in the experimental lab, when they thought they had these pseudoplateau bursting cells, they found that it is incredibly hard to get a phase reset that you actually see some bursting. Very difficult. And so we were trying to understand why that could be based on this model. So if I can 
here, that's an attracting state. If I give my system a kick, well, if it's not high enough, I'll just drop back to my attracting state. The kick needs to be high enough so that I enter the basin of attraction of the other attracting state. Okay, so there are two bases of attraction here, and I really need to know how high I should go. Well, at first thought, you'd say, well, I'll just go here, but this is actually in 3D space. I've taken out calcium, but I still have my gating variable. So I should look at this picture in 3D space. And so here you see this bifurcation diagram with the calcium line again. But what is actually happening, I'm sitting at the equilibrium here, and if I apply the current that generates an effect in the voltage, I will shoot straight up. Well, there's no attractive in sight. We're not going to get there. And so you really need to understand how this phase space is organized. And so the first thing to realize is where actually is my basin of attraction of that upper state? And there are two candidates here because basins of attractions are bounded by stable manifolds, typically. And I have two saddle objects. I have a periodic orbit and I have an equilibrium. And so the first question is what do these manifolds actually look like? So this is the stable manifold of the equilibrium. So it's the saddle equilibrium here, and as Arthur Sherman said, this is the set matrix. Why did he say that? Well, it's a big thing. It's a big object, a big surface, and if you just go beyond that saddle point, you should be in the basin of attraction. And so let me illustrate that a bit better. What Arthur Sherman was alluding to is the fact that if you're sitting at this silent phase and you give your system a kick and you will land somewhere below this surface, where below is relative to this uh, satellite equilibrium, you take a neighborhood here, then I mean that's the, the, in this picture I guess below it, then you will effectively follow the unstable manifold of this satellite equilibrium. And you just go straight back up. Whereas if you sit above this surface, you will effectively follow the other side of the unstable manifold of the cell equilibrium. And you can see here that this unstable manifold makes an excursion, and it creates a spike. But it creates only one spike, that's not a burst. And so, Arthur Schumann was a bit at a loss, and I was like, well, we have another candidate. We have a periodic orbit here, and I can calculate also the stable manifold of this periodic orbit. And as you can see here, this surface of the satellite equilibrium is rolling up around that banana-shaped stable manifold of the periodic orbit. And the actual basin of attraction is inside this tube, or this cylinder. And so here I've taken away the stable manifold of the equilibrium, and um, and just show you the stable manifold of the periodic orbit here in a transparent way and here by chopping off this front part and making it solid but you can look inside and the bursting phase is right there. So, the big question now is, I'm at such a silent phase, I give my system a kick, how do I get into that basin? And so, the crucial idea that uh, Arthur Schumann had was like, well, what if we don't give a pulse, but we actually hold this current for a while? Then it should work. As long as we're high enough, we should go there. And so, what we did was pick a particular value of the applied current and then hold it and see what happens. But in the analysis here, what you see is that if you're putting your applied current in, that means you change the voltage equations. As an effect, you actually change the attractors in the system. And so you can, the, the, the silent phase equilibrium actually isn't an attractor in this system when the applied current is on. That's why you leave from it. But then the actual attractor that you get is some point that sits here in the spiral and curves somewhere over there. It's outside the basin of attraction of the bursting phase. And so anywhere along this orbit that I get from holding the applied current, I need to time it exactly right 
so that I sit inside the basin of attraction. And because of these computations, we could figure out exactly when that would be. Because I have this little, I actually draw it in a different color, this is a, a light blue color, and there's a tiny bit here where you have another excursion into the basin, but then the spiraling goes to an attractor that is not actually in the basin of the bursting phase. And so, the outcome of this is that we could really describe precisely how the system would behave thinking that I could turn from calcium to one. And there were really two options if you want, but there's the one segment that was the longest. We decided if you hold it for that amount of time, then it should work. And so there are, uh, if you want, mathematical conclusions here that uh, you know, we really used the analysis that was introduced by John Rintel and uh, predicted the resetting behavior based on this singular limit. And uh, the difficulties of the reset to the bursting have been really highlighted by doing these computations. Now, for Dr. Sherman, he thought it was crucial because he could not understand how phase space could be organized like that. To him, he only looks at these planar pictures and you just bring voltage up and that should do the trick. So, for the neuroscience, we have actual quantitative information. What's the size of the applied current that you should use? How long should you hold it? And that's when it should work. And so you can formulate a precise experimental protocol. Okay, so I'm going to do one more case study. And this is uh, from a completely different area of application. This is in civil engineering. Um, this is when you have a frame and you're subjected to an earthquake. Now, a frame can actually collapse, but it can also remain standing but have a structural failure that you could not perhaps see. And so it would not be an unsafe building. And so what um, Nick Alexander, my primary collaborator, has been looking at is, is how do you, what can you do with building the frame such that you can allow quite a, a strong earthquake and um, still uh, <coughs> prevent uh, structural failure of your frame. And so they build these steel posts that are connected in a special way, there is like a steel cable inside that is stretched. And so you, you're, you're getting the effect of a hinge that snaps back if you would stop the excitation. And so the way to think about it is I have a building, this earthquake comes by, so my building starts tilting. There's a certain tilt angle that I will call fine. And at some point, when the angle is, too, is large enough, if you want, the hinge will open. And then I can allow a larger tilt angle. Like I can't go further, I'll peel over, but the building will not. And then it snaps back in place and you will be standing upright again. And everything is fine. And so uh, in this paper, we really derived the precise model equations and tested and validated them against experimental data. <coughs> and uh, one interesting thing is that we found that the model is actually equivalent to a tight rocking block. And that is not just for this frame, but that's any number of, um, of floors in the building and any number of rooms, if you want, per floor. And so, um, <coughs> this elastic foundation, that's because of the hinged um, effect. Now, all these validations were done using uh, the sine wave as our earthquake. And so, here are the equations. Again, I'm not giving you the specific formulas, but you can see that this is essentially a pendulum equation. That's my rocking block. And the right-hand side would be my earthquake. Now, this function mu phi, the stiffness, is actually the identity. So it's just phi when the building is just rocking as a rocking block, but the hinge hasn't opened yet. And the equation has been scaled such that between minus 1 and 1, that's this regime. And so when phi is 1, scale to 1, that's when the hinge opens. And the structural failure occurs when the total rocking angle phi is larger than 10 or less than minus 10. Now, 
there are two uh, parameters here. I have a gamma that would be tapping here, and then I fix my frequency of the earthquake uh, at just some number. And we're going to look at A initially 0 0.6. So maybe we should hurry up now. Um, this is a brute force simulation. We look in phi, phi dot space, pick all the initial conditions and see whether we get structural failure or not. So if you're in the white region, the, rock will do, the, the frame will just be rocking and everything is fine. You never exceed minus 10, 10 an interval for phi. But if you're in this blue regime, for example, you have a large angle and your velocity is positive and also large, so you go straight out of the phi equal 10 boundary. And so in between, of course, there is an orbit which would hit this boundary phi equal 10, but then do it at zero velocity. And that's what we call grazing. And I can set up this grazing phenomenon as a two-point boundary value problem. And so here are two examples. I have an initial condition, phi dot's not shown here, but I need phi and phi dot. That I say I choose the phi and phi dot at time equals zero such that at the end point, I'm at the point phi equal 10 and phi dot equals zero. Now, there's one free parameter here still, and that's the total time it takes before I graze. And I can do this at the other boundary as well. Here's an example. Again, phi is given here at about minus 9, but phi dot is not. Um, and I can follow this trajectory. Here I miss, but then I graze at minus 10. And so my boundary condition would be that phi is minus 10 and phi dot is 0. And again, the total time that could take is variable. So I can calculate two families is GR, the right grazing orbit, and the left grazing orbit, GL. And that you can set up as a two-point boundary value problem. You have a nice, all the smooth results hold. So you can find these two families, and here they are. I have a, a big curve here. These are all the five, five dot pairs that if you start at time equals zero, you'll eventually graze. Note the scale. Uh, minus 10, 10 is, uh, you can think it's about at zero. So I've gone way outside. I need to post process this family. I have a single family, but I'm actually only interested in those grazing orbits that don't start outside minus 10, 10 to begin with. And then as they go to grazing, they remain inside minus 10, 10 for the amount of time up to grazing. So if I do that, I get this picture here, and I've underlaid this brute force simulation to show you that my boundary is very nicely following this. There's some stuff going on here, so let me zoom in. Here, I notice that I get an alternation. My boundary is actually made up by left grazing, then right grazing, then left grazing again, then right grazing again, left grazing again, and so on. And so I have a very nice alternation that introduces a piecewise smoothness in my failure boundary that I would not get from the equations. So that's quite intriguing. Now, I also see that I have these additional curves here that are actually in the regime where I fail. These are grazing orbits that will fail a bit later. And they actually have very nice meaning. If I change the colors but I only and I want to know whether I leave at plus 10 or I leave at minus 10. Then the plus 10, that's the green ones, and then the blue ones are the minus 10. And you see that the grazing orbit families exactly delimit where I switch from grazing or going out left or right. And so I get a lot more information that I hadn't actually expected from these calculations. So, just very quickly, let me change the amplitude. And so this is the picture you saw. And my A is 0.6. Here is 0.61. This whole piece by smoothness gets these nice fingered structures. And then I change only in the third decimal place and I suddenly get a very interesting transition. And my failing region, uh, my safe region, is now split up into two parts. 
and I can increase again to the third decimal place, and this goes very quickly, it fills up, and at point 62, I really have two well-separated regions. Eventually, of course, everything will fill up. If you have a very, very strong earthquake, there is nothing you can do. Okay, so I really need to stop now. I have shown you numerical methods, but also how to use these methods in combination with the theory to make progress in problems we don't understand yet. Um, one very strong claim that I want to make is that these are very, very accurate computations. We know what kind of numerical error we are dealing with. And so, what you're getting, if you take the numerical error into account, can really use, be used as a quantitative measure uh, along with the theory to explain what is going on. Um, the manifold computations also really suggest new results. What we can do is set up the boundary value problem. We have a well-defined boundary value problem. Everything is numerically sound. And then we can calculate things that perhaps from manifold theory you didn't know existed yet. And um, I guess I'll really stop here now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so, so, um, yeah, okay, so if you're really experienced in earthquake, then I wasn't in the, in the Christchurch one, but I was at one when I was at Caltech, and um, it's really the horizontal ones that, um, that this model is describing, we're, and they're actually thought to be perpendicular to the frame, if you want, so we really treat it as a planar problem. And, uh, and so, yes, yeah, so it's a good question. You want to have variations there. And uh, these computational methods certainly should allow for more generalizations here. So, so you have, have you thought about I have thought about it because I've now made contact with civil engineers in Auckland and they're very interested in the <laughs> Here, okay. Are you going to put a speakers?